Hi, I'm Anderson Brown. Uh, today I'm going to give you a very basic introduction to Spinoza, uh, one of the first generation of early modern philosophers, that is one of the 17th century rationalists. The rationalists, the first wave of the sort of scientific revolution in the 1600s. Other famous uh, 17th century rationalists are Descartes, uh, Leibniz, and I certainly would include Isaac Newton in that group. Let me get up my, uh, there we go. Get up my screen for you there. And this always takes me a second because I'm not very good at technology. And so there we go. All righty then. Uh, so yes, Spinoza, a very interesting philosopher, a philosopher who's kind of, um, he is a very uh, independent thinker, a man who did all his work basically by himself, not a lot of institutional affiliations or any really in his life. Uh, and subsequently, one thing that goes on with Spinoza is that he has to make up his own vocabulary, his own nomenclature, if you will. And he's one of these philosophers that I think who keeps, that sort of keeps, uh, people from understanding him very well because there's a lot of sort of jargon. He has a lot of terms that he's using for his own specific reasons. And he wants you, uh, while well, you sort of need to learn them or attempted to learn them. Uh, he's very much like a lot of the great German philosophers this way, Hegel, Kant, Heidegger, in that there's a certain language that you sort of have to learn. I find, I mean, I, you know, I look at philosophy very much as a form of literature. I think that's important. I don't think it's sort of faux science or anything like that. Uh, and I think it's really to your tastes. I know that uh, a lot of people of philosophical bent actually very much enjoy learning a lot of vocabulary and a lot of jargon. My goal today is to really sort of skirt around that. Uh, and again, I want to give you a very basic introdu introduction to Spinoza and his thought, putting him in the context of philosophy in general so that he can be understood. So let's get on with that. A uh, little bit of biography. In Spinoza's case, the biography is very important. Uh, he was born, uh, the first bullet point, to a family of Sephardic Jewish refugees from the Portuguese Inquisition. Family went through hard times, although his father managed to become a successful merchant in Amsterdam. Uh, the Dutch Republic, I mean, so much of the Baroque period, especially the intellectual and artistic life of the Baroque period, we really just wouldn't have if not for the Dutch Republic by far uh, the most liberal place to be, a place where many people went uh, fleeing from more repressive precincts during that century. So we can thank the Dutch Republic for a lot of the cultural heritage that we get from the 1600s. But there was this large, uh, because of the, um, the war between the Dutch and the Spanish uh, and there that was had been fought in Holland and gotten its uh, freedom from its colonial status from the Spanish crown. And so there was a very large group of uh, exiles and expats from the Iberian Peninsula in Holland in the 17th century. Uh, the converso, the exiled Jewish conversos, conversos were Jewish people who had been made to, uh, to convert to Catholicism. Of course, many of them had only done that in name and secretly uh, followed uh, Jewish rites. So for that reason, because of that political and cultural pressure, they did tend to be fairly doctrinaire and closed. Another thing about Spinoza, though, I will mention, uh, well, let me go with the second bullet point is easier to understand. He was, uh, from a very early age, he was seen to be an intellectual talent. Uh, he was educated up to a point in the Jewish school, uh, but he was very uh, assertive with his own thinking. He always, Spinoza right out of the gate is a very independent thinker who just calls it like he sees it. Uh, when he was only 23, the age of so a lot of people sort of graduating from college in our day, in our day, he was placed under the curse of all curses by the rabbinical authorities. Uh, the curse of all curses, that is every possible curse is now put on you. Uh, unfortunately, that also uh, mandated his ostracism. No one, including his uh, own family or friends, 
were permitted to actually talk to Spinoza. It, it may be that, um, you know, reading between the lines, it wasn't quite the sort of social death sentence that it seemed. Um, Spinoza, most people capitulated to this kind of pressure quite quickly, but Spinoza never did. He did, I say in that second bullet point, uh, out of respect for his history, we can call him Benedict, the Latin term, rather than Benito or Baruch, uh, Baruch or other uh, Portuguese or, or Jewish terms. And Spinoza himself did want to be called uh, Benedict for that reason, actually, during his lifetime. Um, third bullet point, Spinoza was unusual in never capitulating to this. Uh, and this did force him to maintain a certain low profile. He left Amsterdam for a while, then came back. Uh, he, like many philosophers in the Baroque period, was not able to publish completely freely. His thoughts were very, very controversial, uh, but he was well known. His thoughts, his thoughts also were well known. Uh, he had a loyal following of admirers. On his death, they went to his apartments and uh, gathered all his papers together. They were edited and published much in the same way uh, also at the beginning of the century that Shakespeare's works were very carefully edited and published by his admirers after his death. Like Shakespeare, Spinoza was at the same time too, I, as I say, Spinoza was appreciated by those who knew him as a rare genius. And so uh, quite a number of his works, the ethics of course being his acknowledged as his masterpiece were edited. Uh, he was visited by Leibniz. He was known to many. So uh, an independent person, a person of some bravery who insisted on his own right to, to think and to think what he thought. <laughs> and uh, I think that's very much reflected in his philosophy. I'll talk a little bit more about that today. Of course, he's again, he's one of these Baroque rationalists the Baroque period mapping right onto the 1600s pretty exactly, making it easier, an easy period to understand historically. The first century of what we would call the scientific revolution, the 18th century, the 1700s, uh, characterized by empiricism and the growth of empirical science. The century before that, the Baroque 1600s, uh, sort of an age of reason, if you will, an age when the intellectual community started pushing back hard on the more dogmatic uh, religious heritage. Uh, this is this, still this long transition coming out of the Renaissance. The 17th century, a time of cultural and scientific revolution. Uh, first bullet point, intellectual struggle through this enormously complex transitional period. Two things I'd mentioned there, I say trying to reconcile the Platonic Christian heritage with the new natural scientists. Uh, one is oftentimes you'll hear people remark that these people were under pressure from the religious authorities and only pretended to be theists, only pretended to be believers to stay out of trouble. I don't think that's really true about really any of them. Uh, I think they, they do uh, talk about the philosopher's God. That is this term God is sort of a philosophical term of art often for them, certainly very much so in the case of Spinoza. But I think they were also, all of them, including Isaac Newton, very uh, sincere theists, very sincere believers. The other thing that I'd say, I, I, don't, I consider going into it, I'll, I'll just mention it here. He, uh, again, ostracized by the Jewish community, uh, found intellectual compatriots in some of the Protestant groups of the time. And his thought, I think, has a lot of Protestant Christian elements in it. I think that's something also that we don't notice about Spinoza because, of course, he is uh, by heritage Jewish. Um, but uh, there's a lot of Protestant thinking, I think, in Spinoza. Second bullet point, Galileo's astronomy was at the center of Baroque thought, uh, culminating in the uh, mathematical models of Newton. Newton took Galileo's uh, mathematical methods for astronomy and sort of broadened them out to uh, all of the rest of science. And another person involved in this is Thomas Hobbes, who also took Galileo's basic ontology of matter and motion and tried to apply it to psychology and the social uh, studies as well. Uh, and that's all worth mentioning because Spinoza also very much involved in the science of the time, very well educated in the science of the time. 
and working on this, this relationship between the new natural science, as I said, and some of uh, the uh, older culture, uh, platonic ideas, but also religious ideas. So that last bullet point is on this slide is just essential to understanding Spinoza and what he's up to. I think if you're missing it, it's just impossible to get your bearings trying to uh, get a handle on Spinoza. He is essentially concerned with the relationship between God and nature, which he identifies, uh, mathematics and natural science, necessity and contingency, God, mathematics, necessity, nature, natural science, contingency. How are these things related? The whole issue of mental causation is something that is central to 17th century rationalism. All of them, Descartes, uh, Malebranche, uh, Spinoza, Leibniz, are all uh, talking about mental causation, uh, theistic causation, physical causation. As I say there, that is sort of first philosophy for them. So, uh, so this is really what Spinoza is thinking about. He's thinking about this relationship between uh, what Plato thought about this relationship between transcendental mathematics with its properties of being necessary, of being individual, of being universal, and the new natural science looking at the natural world and trying to develop ways of studying and understanding the natural world. So Spinoza's basic argument, I mean, this is just the basic argument uh, in introducing anybody to Spinoza, basically goes like this. Uh, for It's the first bullet point. God is infinite. And so if there was any kind of boundary anywhere, that that's the way I always put it, that had God on one side and sort of non-God on the other, well, that would be a limit to God. And that's not possible. Therefore, the conclusion of that is everything is God. Metaphysically speaking, Spinoza decided that everything was God. Spinoza is a metaphysical monist. A monist is uh, someone who ontologically speaking thinks the only basic uh, kind of being is one kind of being, not a dualist, like a mind-body dualist, or a God-universe dualist, or uh, any other kind of dualist, rather a monist. We usually think of mo monism as materialism, the view that everything is matter, or everything is natural. But Spinoza is a monist. He thinks there's only one kind of primary being, but he says everything is God. He identifies God with nature by virtue of the fact that, after all, God is everything. God is the only thing that exists. So we're all part of God, including you and me. Second bullet point, he's a rationalist on this deep ontological level. And he says the universe is both the mind and the body of God, which is one of the most fascinating things about Spinoza. Thus, uh, he thinks the universe is logically perfect and necessary. This is his thesis about it. And this perfection is the sole source of value. Interesting always to look at the similarities and differences between Spinoza and Plato on that uh, view. Uh, third bullet point, the identification of God in nature makes physical science sort of sacramental. I mean, I think this is kind of the genius of Spinoza. You know, the question is, what is a God-fearing society going to do with this new natural science? And Spinoza says, God is nature and nature is God. And when I say physical science is sacramental, that is when we're studying uh, the world and nature with scientific method, we're studying God. This is sort of uh, Spinoza's claim. A claim also taken up by Newton, Isaac Newton, who's a very religious man. And of course, he developed his natural mathematical descriptions of forces. Again, Newton saying, I don't have any theories. I'm giving you the mathematical description of forces. He gives you the equation for gravitational attraction and so on. But Newton uh, also devoted many, many hundreds of pages to theological writing. And he thought that when he developed, say, the equation for the uh, for calculating the attraction between any two massy objects, uh, he was revealing the face of God, this ability that the, that the universe had of being described uh, mathematically and formally, he thought was evidence that... Uh, of, of the God-like nature of the universe. Spinoza's identification of God in nature reconciles inquisitive naturalism with theism. As I say, that's kind of one of the really most, I think, impressive achievements and eliminates miracles from theistic dogma. Again, getting back to these sort of Protestant resonances um, because everything is God. So, so there's no need for some sort of special intervention of God in, in the affairs of the world. 
uh, God is just uh, identical with the manifest state of the world. Uh, so Spinoza and Indian philosophy, one, another uh, fascinating topic of study and one that's beguiled many intellectuals looking at Spinoza over the years. Uh, here's, here's the thing. Uh, this is one of the more technical things, I guess, to discuss here looking at Spinoza in that first bullet point. Um, we think of infinite uh, as corporeal sort of absolute concepts of space and time. Infinite, like space is infinite. Time is infinite sort of expanses with no beginning and no end. And that's a typical sort of understanding that we have, we modern people, when we hear this word infinite, the concept of infinite. But infinite in Spinoza is more like the concept that we find in classical Asian philosophy, notably in Indian philosophy, Hindu and Buddhist philosophy. And this is the idea uh, for Mahayana philosophers like Nergarjuna, for example, that, you know, uh, to say that something's finite is to say that it has a surface, a surface that distinguishes it from everything else. And infinite in this tradition is that is lacking any surface, lacking any distinction from anything else. So to say that the world is infinite, the world is a unity, the world is the one. So the perspective of seeing everything as the one rather than uh, living life in the many. So. Uh, enlightenment in the Asian tradition very often, all, maybe always involves uh, cultivating this perspective of the unity of everything. The, the real notion of nirvana is this falling away of the boundary between oneself and everything else, becoming one with the universe. And that's really the sense of uh, God's infinity that we find in Spinoza. So second bullet point, the Brahmanic Hindu universe as personal God, the Godhead, the Godhead Brahma. Uh, infinite modes of being beyond the material and the mental. Uh, it's very difficult to understand because uh, Spinoza would say human beings understand the material, the extended in space and the mental psychological experience, ratiocination. But God has infinite modes. What are these other modes? Spinoza wants to talk about it and the Hindu uh, philosophers will talk about it as well, but we're not going to go into it here. Uh, stoic harmony with nature as the enlightened path, again, something very similar to Asian thinking, not only uh, Hindu thinking about coming to be and passing away, but also Taoist thinking. The Chinese tradition, for example, is also a teaching that the path is the path uh, in harmony with nature, understanding nature and not resisting nature, but rather going with the flow of nature, the flow of qi, as we might say in the Chinese tradition. Uh, these teachings are common to Spinoza. And as I say, there are the Prajnaparamita, the Long Sutra on Perfect Wisdom and other sources in both Indian and Chinese uh, philosophy. So, you know, uh, Spinoza and Indian philosophy, yeah, there's a lot of similarities so many people will be so impressed by this that they'll say spinoza just is like hindu philosophy all the way through uh, so that's something that's there and very much a uh, rewarding topic to go into spinoza and panpsychism now let me talk about that in the last slide i talked about that notion of finite and infinite as not the ones that we usually think of uh here let's talk about this question of panpsychism uh, oftentimes, this is the issue is Spinoza panpsychist. And there's in philosophy of mind in recent years, there was a little brief fad about talking about panpsychism. So let me talk about that. First bullet point Spinoza is teaching that mind and matter uh, are two, again, out of an infinite number of modes of being, whatever that means, is something that has been a very pregnant idea for modern philosophy of mind, where we see this called double aspect theory. The idea is that every existing thing is both a mental description and a physical description, comes under both a mental description and a physical description somehow. Of course, uh, in the case of inanimate objects, uh, hard to see what it means to say that they might come under a psychological description. In the case of uh, thoughts, feelings, and other mental uh, objects, it's hard to see what it might mean to say they come under a physical description. I want to get back to that running both ways. Um, so on this view, second bullet point, uh, what, what is appealing about that to modern philosophers of mind? Philosophy of mind being the study of the, the metaphysical 
uh, study of the relationship between the mind and the body. Well, on this view, psychological, that is intentional or belief, desire, explanations, explaining people's behavior in terms of their beliefs, desires, hopes, fears, and so on, are not reducible to, but are also not contradictory with physical uh, explanations of behavior, say neurophysiological causal uh, stories about the production of behavior. And that's, again, something that's of interest to modern philosophers who are interested in uh, the mind-body relation because it says, well, there are two different ways of describing things. And so again, one doesn't reduce or collapse into the other. So that's again, been something that has been inspirational, a, a sort of pregnant idea to investigate for a lot of modern philosophers of mind. But one thing that comes out of that is then you often find people wondering about Spinoza, well, is he pan-psychic? That is, does he think that there is mind in all things? Third bullet point, this doctrine can be interpreted as claiming that all objects can be understood as possessing mind. That's the question. But this is an over-literal, I say, Cartesian reading. Rather, intelligence and consciousness are eminent in nature. Part of the mistake there is to think that mind as we conceive it, uh, mind as we experience it, is sort of the, the end-all and be-all of mind, uh, this sort of human notion of mind. And so then the idea is that Spinoza must be saying uh, with his double aspect theory that, that something like human mind is in everything, uh, in tables and chairs and all the rest of it. Uh, that is a little bit on the anthropocentric side, though. Rather, intelligence and consciousness are eminent in nature. That is, uh, it's just that I think I don't want it to be sound more mysterious than it is. The universe is the kind of place where given time and the right conditions, uh, conscious and intelligent beings will evolve because it's that kind of a universe. And so uh, it is a universe. So that's the sense there of that word eminent. Some complex bodies will manifest what we think of as mental properties. Again, taking ourselves as always too seriously. And that's what I mean again by that Cartesian idea that it must be then that there are sort of Cartesian minds and all of the things in the tables and chairs and so on. Uh, and that's, a, again, a kind of sophomoric reading, I would say. To separate mind from body that way is dualistic and anthropocentric. Notice that when you say, well, the table must also have a mind, uh, that is what I mean by dualistic, okay? There isn't any distinction between these things. They're all one. Spinoza and Stoicism, uh, worth looking into, thinking of Stoicism as broad philosophical sense here. Um, you, of course, we have Stoicism coming out of the Greek tradition and then the Hellenic and Roman tradition, the Stoics being sort of the leading scientists of that time. Spinoza, though, broadly speaking, is a kind of ethical Stoic. Let me explain what that means. First bullet point, human activity is wholly integrated with the rest of the causal order. Again, it's not a miracle. The, uh, again, the way I'm using that adjective Cartesian, that the mind sort of in the world, but not of it. So something sort of that makes a human being different from the rest of the physical things, uh, different from the rest of the physical causal order. Spinoza rejects that as do the Stoics. And as with the Stoics, Spinoza argues that human fulfillment and happiness are attained by understanding and conforming to the dictates of nature. Notice that's also, again, um, Taoism, Hinduism, broadly speaking, a lot of Asian philosophy counsels the same. The right path is to be in harmony with nature, to go with the flow of nature, the flow of uh, the, the energy of nature. An interesting thing about Spinoza, second bullet point, is he rejects this teleological or goal-directed model of the cosmos or humans place in it. Think of um, ontological proofs for the existence of, or, or teleological rather proofs for the existence of God like the design argument. Spinoza rejects those. Why? Because uh, God nature, God slash nature is already fully realized, already fully there. So there's no movement towards the unmoved mover as we find in Aristotle's remarks at the end of the physics. There's none of that in, Spino in Spinoza. Rather, the spirit is more Epicurean. Epicurus, another ancient philosopher who's had another bit of a vogue in modern philosophy in the late, uh, late latter years. Uh, equanimity, 
based in faith in God's goodness is the foundation of happiness. Negative thoughts and feelings are the products of errors of understanding of human finitude. If we saw everything uh, in toto, we would understand that everything is happening uh, necessarily. Uh, that can be a problem if you're trying to put Spinoza over to, um, to beginning philosophers. Third bullet point, it's not as fatalistic as it sounds, again, to dualistic Cartesian thinkers. The Cartesian thinker, and again, as I'm using that word, will think that, um, well, if everything's happening necessarily, then there's no freedom, and that's terrible, that's a depressing idea, that's a self-defeating idea. But that's really not the sense of Spinoza, nor of Stoicism properly understood. Uh, on Spinoza's view, the human person is just as much a causal force as anything else in nature. Uh, the identity of the mental with the physical works both ways, just as much a causal force as anything else in nature. Actually, an interesting point that the 19th century philosopher Nietzsche makes, I'll just note that. Um, and then a technical point in the third bullet point there that I think is underappreciated again because of our Cartesian instincts. The identity of the mental with the physical works both ways. And the Stoics had this, the classical Stoics had this idea too, that everything is an object of some kind. Anything that you can frame mentally also is a physical thing. Uh, so, you know, again, we, we often will be idealists in that philosophical sense there, thinking that the idea here is that everything's mental coming out of a sort of Cartesian, Kantian tradition, but not with Spinoza. Spinoza and, and the Stoics, as I say, thinks that uh, this works both ways. Everything that you could describe as mental could also be described as physical, and, and that's important to remember that, um, that, that that works in both directions, such that our actions define us, which is a beautiful thought. Uh, in Spinoza, there's no sense of self-denial or repression in Stoic acceptance. Again, rather, it's a prescription. What we need to do is to understand nature. So very pro-science. Spinoza so very interested in science. So much an intellectual of his day up on all the astronomy, all the chemistry, a lens grinder. Uh, therefore, involved, again, in both uh, astronomical thinking and the new chemical thinking of Leeuwenhoek, for example, a Dutch um, developer of the microscope. No sense of self-denial or repression and stoic acceptance of nature. I think Spinoza is very much a, a Stoic, but that needs to be explained carefully uh, to for people with our Cartesian instincts so that, so that we don't find that to be some kind of nihilistic idea, because it's not a nihilistic idea in Spinoza at all. Spinoza and Leibniz is an interesting little point of philosophy. Plato, for example, the Timaeus, uh, thought that only an intentional being that is a person uh, that makes choices based on beliefs, values, goals, and so on. As I said before, uh, a person whose behavior can be described in terms of their beliefs, desires, hopes, and fears, uh, such that it may have chosen otherwise, could be said to be moral. That is, we only find something praiseworthy or blameworthy uh, if we think that someone could have acted otherwise. And Plato, a moral realist, very much wanted the universe to be a a place that, that had ethics built into it, as Spinoza thinks as well. And so, so Plato gives us, a, again, a kind of teleological proof, very, very much a, a design argument that uh, there is the evidence of a divine designer in the functionality of all of nature. And in, for Plato, on Plato's agenda, that was important because he wanted to say that the universe is the work of the craftsman, as he calls them there, the Timaeus, uh, and this is a moral being. Spinoza doesn't have that second bullet point on the slide. Spinoza's God's logically and physically perfect, fully realized, and therefore eternally unchanging. Looks like a very, for one thing, a very strict kind of determinism, and there's no contingency in the God cosmos. Uh, you know, again, think of the, the perfection of mathematics, but Spinoza doesn't see any difference between mathematics and matter, unlike Plato. Uh, this God makes no choices, performs no action, and so cannot be said to be a praise or blameworthy moral agent on the picture that in order to be a moral agent, it has to be that for any given action of yours, you could have acted otherwise. The brilliant, but at least as difficult <clears throat> as Spinoza, philosopher, Leibniz, uh, Gottfried Leibniz, uh, at the end of the 
um, 17th century, recognized this problem in Spinoza. It was in his reading of Spinoza, and he noticed that um, in Spinoza, you didn't have a moral God because you had a perfect, necessary, eternal, and eternally realized God. And addressing this, uh, Spinoza came up, uh, like, like Spinoza, remember, Leibniz says he's got the principle of sufficient reason that for everything that happens for every state of affairs, there is an explanation that's sufficient to explain it. Uh, that's very close to Spinoza. But Leibniz saw that, um, that Spinoza's God was a kind of amoral God. Spinoza said, uh, and Spinoza also very much onto the problems of the metaphysics of modality, uh, a brilliant thinker that way. So Spinoza says that God chose the best of all possible worlds. Famously, of, of course, um, Voltaire uh, in the next century, the Enlightenment appears a century, satirizing Leibniz with his novel Candide. But uh, look at what uh, Leibniz, a very brilliant philosopher, achieves with his doctrine that God chose the best of all possible worlds. He, he recognizes modal possibility, he talks about the modal status of the universe. He posits a moral God, that's what he has set out to do with the argument that God is a moral agent who chose the best of all possible worlds when presumably God could have chosen otherwise. And of course, the most famous uh, consequence of Leibniz's argument that he's got a, a, a answer to the theological problem of evil. Kind of a funky answer, really. I mean, you know, the, the reason that we have like um, earthquakes and, and bad teeth and stuff is because otherwise we, we wouldn't have, you know, like chocolate and Neil Young and stuff. But, but nonetheless, you get uh, the recognition of modality, a moral God, an argument to address the theological problem of evil. So that... Um, that sequence from Spinoza's thinking to Leibniz's thinking is also a nice, interesting little piece of philosophy there. Spinoza's political theory in 1760, the Tractatus Theologico Politicus was published. This was the only major work of Spinoza to be published in his lifetime. It was extremely co uh, uh, controversial. Nowadays, uh, philosophy as a field sort of concentrates on Spinoza's metaphysics. But Spinoza's political theory, certainly during his own time, very much uh, debated and discussed. And in his posthumous uh, writings, he has further uh, works of political theory. First bullet point, Spinoza is an organic political theorist. In this way, he is like Plato and Aristotle. He sees human social and political formations as continuous with the rest of nature, as just another expression of nature. Uh, this this argument existed in the ancient Greeks. Uh, the um, the sophists and Protagoras uh, thought that uh, human beings had to construct a a polis, but uh, but the academics thought that uh, no, this was like ants or bees or wolves or horses. You just find human beings very naturally in a social state, a political arrangement. I, I think there's a lot to commend that rather than a constructivist like most other early modern social theorists, including Thomas Hobbes, who I mentioned before and who Spinoza is often compared to when discussing his political theory, um, or uh, later on Rousseau, uh, the social contract theory that humans uh, have rights and responsibilities that they agree to in a social contract so that they can live peacefully together. Spinoza doesn't take it that way. Again, Spinoza thinks that Human beings are just naturally sort of found in some kind of political uh, arrangement. And so, second bullet point, he thought that the goal of political theory was to promote social harmony and peace. It was sort of an engineering challenge rather than to adjudicate, as Plato, say, does in the Republic between one sort of regime or the other. Although Spinoza clearly has broadly democratic sympathies because Spinoza thinks that each individual person needs to uh, realize themselves and become fulfilled. Uh, that's really uh, a guiding uh, part of his spirit. Third bullet point, Spinoza thought of religion as a cultural vehicle of ethical norms. Very controversial. This is one of the things that really set people off against Spinoza. He really didn't see religion. He just, and he said it in his lifetime. He really didn't see religion as sort of explaining the, the mysteries of the cosmos, of talking about the workings of the universe. He really saw religion more, and he said so, as a cultural vehicle of ethical norms that people had. He thought that was really the function of religion. 
And he thought of politics more as an extension of natural science. Again, the political theorists, a the kind of engineer, how are we gonna set up society so that we maintain peace? In that sense, he certainly is similar to Thomas Hobbes, his contemporary. Uh, and um, so he advocates for a state religion. And furthermore, he says that individuals ought to be uh, obedient to the state religion, just as Hobbes says, you know, you've got to be obedient to the mechanism of the state because it's the sovereign power that adjudicates between conflicts between individuals. And Spinoza, again, similar to Hobbes that way. Uh, state religion as a mechanism of social harmony. Spinoza, of course, living in a place that was riven with all sorts of political schisms, people getting killed, uh, much to Spinoza's distress and horror, in fact, during his lifetime. Uh, schisms between Protestants and the Dutch Republic, and of course, further problems that he had with the Jewish community. Uh, and the Catholic Church still very much on the scene. Third bullet, uh, fourth bullet point, last bullet point on the slide. At the same time, as he argues for a state religion, you can see that he wants a state religion because he doesn't want religious sectarianism all over the place. He argues that freedom of thought, public freedom of thought was necessary to allow for individual growth and fulfillment. As I say there, it's impossible not to see his own difficult personal history reflected there. In fact, he wrote the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, uh, which was finally published in 1670, uh, very much because of his distress at some of the political violence that was happening between uh, Protestant sects with which he was involved intellectually at the time in the Dutch Republic. So um, a very, I think he's a very personal thinker when we look at his political theory. And notice also then that his political theory is very much something coming out of this overall metaphysical vision that he has. Finally then, to finish our little introduction to Spinoza here, I love this quotation of Bertrand Russell in his very funny History of Western Philosophy. I would recommend reading Russell's History of Western Philosophy for laughs, really. But he says this, which is a great thing. He says this about Spinoza, and I'll just read it out and then I'll be done. Spinoza is the noblest and most lovable of the great philosophers. Intellectually, some others have surpassed him, but ethically he was supreme. As a natural consequence, he was considered during his lifetime and for a century after his death, a man of appalling wickedness. Great uh, English humor there. Uh, okay, so... Again, just a little potted history or, or uh, introduction to Spinoza, um, that God is nature, that he is a metaphysical monist and believes that everything is God and all the consequences of that are the main takeaway, the main thing you want to understand when to understand Spinoza's thought. As I mentioned at the beginning, he has a, a uh, difficult nomenclature and the ethics itself is an interesting book where he tries to write it, where the, the, there's a proof at the beginning and a proof at the end that proofs the proof that he starts with, sort of like something out of Jorge Luis Borges, a continuous loop uh, of everything, sustaining everything else um, nowadays uh, because of Kurt <laughs> Gödel. Gödel, we understand that all systems of mathematics must have at least one uh, unproven premise. But again, we have this wonderful con con concept in Spinoza's book, The Ethics, that it's going to be a self uh, sustaining, self-rationalizing uh, uh, all the way through. A very eccentric text. I recommend reading it. And I would also mention that there are these scolia, sort of a, a little cheat on Spinoza's part where he does just speak extemporaneously about philosophy all through it. So it's, it's not quite as daunting as it looks. But as a work of literature, it's very curious, very involved and very interesting. So I do uh, recommend taking a look at Spinoza's text, The Ethics. All right, so um, with that, I will leave you. That's my introduction to Spinoza. Thank you for your attention. I do appreciate it.